I'm very grateful to Irene Morin for her good words this morning and for starting us in a good way and for welcoming us to the Enoch Cree Nation uh, and Treaty 6 territory. I'm also grateful to the organizers of this event for this opportunity to engage with each of you. So the paper I'm going to talk about today is in draft form, and so your comments and feedback are very welcome. And unfortunately, my co-author, Jason Madden, is not here today, but I want to acknowledge that he shares credit and perhaps I should say responsibility for at least some of the things I'm going to say. So our claim, our thesis, is that the three decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada, the Powley decision, the Manitoba Métis Federation decision, and the Daniels decision, when we take these and put them together, they constitute the trifecta of Métis law. So what we mean by that is that they establish a framework for reconciliation with the Métis. So Powley does that by establishing the test for Métis rights. So how do we establish a Métis right? And it sets out at least a skeletal outline as to who are the Métis. Then we have the Manitoba Métis Federation decision, which establishes legal principles with respect to Métis claims to land. Then, of course, we have the Daniels decision, which establishes the jurisdiction with respect to the Métis and confirms the Crown's duty to negotiate. So, in other words, what we're saying is that these three decisions taken together are a good thing. Now, that might not seem particularly contentious or even interesting after all the Métis won in each of these three decisions. On the other hand though, many scholars and myself included have been very critical of these decisions. And so balancing those critiques with an emphasis on the utility of the decisions is also beneficial. Now in the interest of time, I'm only going to touch on the Powley decision. Now the Powley decision is from 2003. It's not exactly front page news anymore. So you will be forgiven for wondering whether there's any point of going over this material again. Is there anything left to say about Powley? It turns out that almost 15 years later, yes, there actually is a lot left to say about Powley. And this is made clear by Thomas Isaac's report. So back in 2015, the federal government tasked Thomas Isaac with researching and uh, making recommendations for achieving reconciliation with the Métis with respect to Section 35 rights. So in doing this, Isaac spoke with not only Métis uh, governments and Métis citizens, but also representatives from the federal government and provincial governments. Now what Isaac's report reveals is that there are some fundamental misconceptions held by government representatives about the law pertaining to Métis people. I'm only going to touch on one of these misconceptions. So specifically, Isaac heard the notion from government representatives that there's some hierarchy of rights within Section 35, for example, that the rights of First Nations supersede the rights of the Métis. And Isaac notes there is no basis for this in law. So where did this come from? Where did this misconception come from? Well, it's based on the derivative rights approach or trace theory. Now, to understand what this is, we have to go back to the Van Der Peet decision. Remember in Van Der Peet, the Supreme Court of Canada established a pre-contact assessment date for assessing Section 35 rights. Now, that has been critiqued by many scholars. It's very problematic, but at least logistically, it is at least possible with respect to First Nations. But of course, it's not even logistically possible for the Métis because by definition, they didn't exist prior to European contact. Okay, so before Pauli, there is this dilemma. How are the Métis going to have rights? They're in Section 35, but how are they going to have rights with this assessment date? So a proposed solution was the derivative rights theory or the trace theory. And according to this approach, Métis rights are derivative of First Nations rights, such that in order for a Métis right to exist, it must be traceable to a First Nation or Inuit right. Okay, so if this had been correct, then the foundation of Métis rights would have been some First Nation or Inuit custom or tradition. And there would have been a hierarchy of rights, right? Métis rights would have been dependent on First Nation or Inuit rights. Now this approach has been critiqued and it was critiqued prior to Pauli by many scholars including Larry Chartrand, Catherine Bell, Darren O'Toole. Government representatives in Pauli though did advance this theory and tried to rely on it but the Supreme Court of Canada very explicitly rejected it at paragraph 38 of Pauli. Right, we can see the explicit re uh, rejection here. 
So what that means is that there is no hierarchy of rights within Section 35. That's simply not a thing, right? That's just not the law. It's, like I said, almost 15 years after Pauli, though, and yet government representatives don't know that, right? So this is astounding. We were talking earlier today about the possibility of using Indigenous laws or how can Indigenous laws have effect within the Canadian system, but the government representatives that the Métis are dealing with don't even know the Canadian law with respect to the Métis, much less Indigenous laws. Okay, so this is one reason why it's still important to discuss the significance of Pali. So my co-author and I are defending the Pali decision as, like I said, a good thing. So it means we have to deal with the critiques of it. Now, one of the most prominent critiques of Pali has to do with the debate between the Métis as individuals of mixed ancestry versus the Métis as a nation or a people. And I think we can think about this as a spectrum, with the Métis as mixed on one end of the spectrum and the Métis as a nation or a people on the other. Now, the Supreme Court of Canada clearly, in Pali, rejects the Métis as mixed view, right? Métis does not refer to individuals who simply have mixed ancestry. Now, Chris Anderson, though, from the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta, in his book Métis, argues that despite this rejection of the Métis as mixed, the court still does not go far enough towards recognizing the Métis as a nation or a people. And he points out the court's focus on the markers of material culture within its decision. And he argues that this exhibits a racialized logic that results in the conception of Métis that's put forward in Pali falling far short of being on the nationhood end of the spectrum. And Anderson's critique is articulated within the discourse of postmodernism. I'm not going to try to retrace his critique. I couldn't do it justice. But instead, what I'm going to try to do is re-articulate it, not in the discourse of postmodernism, but within the language of liberalism. Now, I know that liberalism is not cool, and uh, <laughs> it's not cool to work within the framework of liberalism anymore, but that's what I do, I, that's what I want to do, and I do it because my target audience are judges, and I perceive judges as being amenable and as themselves seeing themselves operating within the framework of liberalism. Okay, so when I talk about liberalism, there's no one accepted uh, standard definition of liberalism, but there are a few key features that I take as uh, being uh, uncontroversial. So we have the twin pillars of liberalism, of the focus on individual autonomy and individual equality. In addition to this, we have the premise of the individual as the rights bearer, and what flows from each of these principles then is this notion that each individual is entitled to define for themselves, determine, to pursue, and if they desire, to revise their own conception of the good life. Okay, so we can see the definition, the test for Métis identity in Pali as running up against these principles of liberalism. Okay, so the, we'll review quickly the test for Métis identity in Pali. So to be Métis, a person has to do three things. First, they have to self-identify as Métis. They have to have an ancestral connection, not simply to an Aboriginal historical community, but specifically to a historical Métis community. Third and finally, they have to be accepted by the modern Métis community, which is the continuation of the historical community. Now, it's this third part of the test that runs up against the principles of liberalism that I mentioned. So when the court talks about this third requirement, what they say is that it's not enough to merely be a member of a Métis political organization, not necessarily. That in addition, what the court is going to be looking for are some of these markers of Métis culture. So they talk about the core of the community acceptance is going to be past and ongoing participation in a shared culture in the customs and traditions that constitute a Métis community's identity. Okay, so what does this mean? Does this mean that we have to learn how to jig, play fiddle music, uh, cook pemmican, and speak Machif in order to be Métis? 
right? What if those of us who identify as Métis don't do these things? So I'm a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario, and uh, I have to admit that whenever I'm making a playlist for myself, say I'm going on a long car ride, and I want some music, it's never once occurred to me to put fiddle music on my playlist. Okay, so there, I said it out loud, I admitted it, I don't like fiddle music. Does that make me a bad Métis person? Does that make me not Métis at all? If it does, then it means that Métis individuals are not entitled to determine, define, and pursue their own conception of the good life. Right? The good life's been defined for them by the Supreme Court of Canada and Pali. The good life is listening to fiddle music, jigging, eating bison burgers, speaking with chef. How can this be? Right? This is illiberal. Everyone else in Canada is entitled to choose their own conception of a good life. How could the Supreme Court of Canada have come up with such an illiberal definition of Métis identity? Well, I don't think that they did, and I don't think that the court sees this as illiberal. But in order to see that, the reason they don't see it as a liberal is because they don't see the Métis as a nation. Instead, they see the Métis as simply a collection of individuals who happen to already from the outset be committed to these customs and traditions. Okay, so does this mean that this critique then is fatal to the Pali decision and our defense of it as a good thing if it's not recognizing Métis nationhood? Maybe not. So the Supreme Court of Canada talks about, like I said, culture, tradition, customs, identity. And we're so used to talking about these things at this very granular level of specificity because that's what the court does in its jurisprudence on the Vanderpeet Section 35 test. But what if when we're articulating the culture, traditions, the customs, and the identity of the Métis at a more foundational level? What if we articulate them as the constituting principles that underlie and inform different instantiations of Métis culture? Right? So instead of talking about these markers of material culture, what if the customs, the traditions, the identity, what if they're principles like kinship, like interdependence, like Wakotoin? Right? So even liberalism isn't a theory of radical relativism. Even liberalism does have some core normative principles, the ones that I mentioned, right? Individual autonomy, individual equality, and the notion that the individual is the rights bearer. So what if the customs, the traditions, the identity of the Métis are articulated at that same level of core foundational normative principles? Then maybe at our next AGA of the Métis Nation of Ontario, I can finally admit out loud to them that I don't like fiddle music and, uh, and still be Métis. All right, so hi, hi, merci, miigwech, thank you. Bonjour. J'aimerais remercier la nation Cree Inuk de me recevoir sur son territoire traditionnel. Et je me fais un plaisir de vous faire entendre le son de la langue française qui est parlé en Alberta depuis des siècles. So, uh, what I informed uh, Patricia that I would be presenting a 27-page long PowerPoint. She um, said to me that I will be short at down if I did that. So I abandoned my PowerPoint altogether and within the next 10 minutes I'll try to be as articulate as I can without my PowerPoint. Um, so I will try to explain to you in a few words um, the results of a research that I conducted a few years ago about various treaty, modern treaty models and their uh, various approaches to managing legal plurality, that is the co coexistence of uh, legal systems within the same space with respect to the same society, same groups. And I have identified two interesting models uh, which I will try to summarize for you this afternoon. Uh, first, the Nishka model and 
secondly, the Labrador Inuit model. Each model approaches uh, the issue of what relationship is going to be established between non-indigenous law and indigenous law uh, for, uh, in a very uh, different uh, manner, in my, in my opinion. So it should be remembered that modern treaties, uh, in fact, are not only about state law. They also involve uh, indigenous law. Indigenous law plays a part in founding a treaty relationship, in founding the indigenous collective that is going to be party to a treaty, and giving legitimacy to that uh, collective uh, from the perspective of entering a treaty relationship with the state. Customary law or non-state indigenous law can also, of course, it will frame the indigenous perspective on treaties and it can also provide substance to the treaty. And it's the latter point that I'm going to look at more particularly, the room or the place or status of non-state indigenous law uh, within treaty law. First, I'd like to present very briefly two working definitions of legal plurality. Um, first, uh, there is what I would call uncoordinated legal plurality. And it occurs when uh, there is no formal interaction between coexisting systems. None of the legal systems acknowledge, acknowledges rules, personal status, interests, rights, liabilities, or institutions originating in the other system. Uh, it doesn't mean that there is no internormative processes going on, but these internormative processes are informal. They're more social facts, cultural phenomena, than being legally structured phenomena. Then there's also coordinated legal plurality, and it occurs when one legal system recognizes aspects of the other legal system, thus creating what I call an intersystemic normative network allowing for the transfer of some rules, personal status, interests, rights, or liabilities arising under one system into the other system. Now, so when an indigenous people contemplates signing a treaty with the crown, it has to make a decision as to what kind of room or space it wishes its own indigenous law to have uh, be recognized, to have recognized in a treaty. And this involves, of course, um, it's a difficult uh, issue, uh, and it's a, largely a cost-benefit calculus, because there are advantages, you know, um, you know in having its non-state law validated, recognized by f the formal system, but there are costs as well, there are problems, there are risks. The main advantage of, of um, coordinated plurality is what I call the shield effect. Uh, it, it, it makes sure, it ensures that what is permitted, prescribed or granted uh, by indigenous law will not be prohibited, ignored or denied by the, by the state. Um, recognition thus protects indigenous law from the disruptive effect of internormative clashes uh, within the ambit of state law. Uh, and the second advantage is the lever, what I call the lever effect, uh, whereby uh, statuses um, and rights arising under indigenous law are translated into entitlements derived not from indigenous law per se, but from state law. For example, a customary parent being recognized as a parent for the purpose of state law means that that parent also is entitled to all the social and economic rights recognized by state law. So that's what I call the lever effect of, of uh, coordinated plurality. Um, the typical costs of, of plura uh, coordinated plurality, of course, is that the state tends invariably tends to adopt a conditional um, and hierarchical approach to coordination. It tends to dis dictate unilaterally conditions for recognition. So what ends up 
to be recognized in many cases is not indigenous law per se, but some kind of hybrid, you know, which is a mixture of, you know, which contains some element of uh, non-state law and several, or more or less, um, uh, several elements of, of state law. Um, so the distortion of, of indigenous law is the classical problem uh, with um, recognition or coordination. So I have five minutes left, so I will explain to you what some indigenous peoples um, decided with respect to that thorny issue of coordination or not coordination. Uh, first, the Nishka Treaty is, in my opinion, a, an example of uncoordinated plurality. Um, and it's fascinating to read in, in, in the first section of the treaty uh, the definition of law, which very explicitly provides that the law, that the term law for the purpose of the treaty does not include uh, the Ayuku and Ayuk, which are the traditional laws of the Nishka. It means that if there's ever a clash between non-state Nishka law and official Nishka law under the treaty, then official law will prevail. And if it comes before court, uh, the judge will have to apply um, the formal law of the treaty and not uh, non-state indigenous law. And I was fascinated to learn uh, when I conducted interviews in the communities with chiefs and negotiators as well, uh, to find out that this was indeed a very, very deliberate choice on the part of the Nishga leaders to make sure uh, that they would insulate their traditional laws and institutions from direct interference by state institutions, including non-indigenous judges. Um, as one of the chiefs said, um, they, they found it was uh, much better to uh, keep a separation between the legal systems. Uh, the leader explained that our traditions were not up for negotiation. Um, there is, of course, a clear risk. Uh, I mean, that approach involves the clear risk of, you know, conflicts and clashes between state Nishgo law and non-state Nishgo law. Uh, but the Nishgo are confident that their traditional institutions are strong enough, vibrant enough, uh, to conduct a permanent dialogue with their official state Nishga institutions so as to negotiate, navigate you know, the two legal orders so as to avoid or minimize risk um, internormative clashes between the two Nishga uh, legal orders. Uh, and the second example, and I will conclude with that, is, is, is a a diff very different approach taken by the Labrador Inuit. Um, now, this agreement, um, in fact, allows for uh, the, the Inuit constitution to declare that Inuit customary law will apply. And indeed, the Labrador Inuit constitution ju does just that. Uh, now, it must uh, be underlined that recognition comes at a price, as I indicated earlier. So we find that the recognition, that's, is it, time is off? Okay, two minutes. Now the recognition under that treaty of, of Inuit customary law is, is partial and conditional. It is, in Inuit customary law is subject to the treaty, of course. It is subject to the Canadian Charter. It is subject to provincial standards. It is subject to the Inuit Charter of Rights and Responsibilities. It is subject to requirements regarding registration and publication. And it is subject to interpretation by state courts. One might even ask whether it is recognized at all. Is it true recognition of customary law? Uh, because the treaty, in fact, requires that all Inuit laws be registered and published, including Inuit customary law. Well, by definition, customary law is fluid, it's dynamic, it's largely unwritten, and if you are forced to codify it by the treaty, one wonders whether it is truly recognition of, of Inuit customary law at all. But um, 
the Inuit government took the very, um, very understandable position that they don't have to codify their custom and that the, in other words, that it's up to them to decide whether they will codify it or not. So far, they haven't codified it. In fact, they've even proclaimed in their constitution that, and I will quote the constitution, uh, Labrador Inuit customary law is the underlying law of the Labrador Inuit. Uh, and Nunatsiavut, for all matters within the jurisdiction or, or authority of the Nunatsiavut Assembly. The Constitution goes so far as to uh, provide that in customary law will apply whenever there is no statute in force with respect to a specific issue. And if there is such a statute and there happens to be uh, a clash, a conflict between statute law and customary law, well, customary law will prevail unless there is a notwithstanding clause in the statute that states that the statute will prevail. I will conclude. Um, you see that the Inuit are ready to face the risks of recognition. Um, they accept the substantial treaty restrictions on their customary law. They are prepared ultimately to let non-indigenous judges to determine the content of their customary law because they seem to think that this is a price worth paying for securing the full support of state institutions in the implementation of their unique legal system. But the Nishga have made the opposite choice. Um, so in the end, it comes down to a political choice, a policy choice, which is largely based on the cost-benefit analysis. Unfortunately, this presentation has been completely disorganized. I've been rushing through my talk from beginning to end, so please forgive me, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Well, I would also like to thank our host. It's been fantastic, and I also am I'm totally impressed by the excellence in the organization of this conference. I'm very appreciative of that. And uh, I'm also appreciative that I was, in fact, put on the agenda. Uh, and I'm not sure, I sort of, over my mind, been thinking about how Bob Dylan once introduced one of his songs, which was, it has nothing to do about nothing. Um, so what it is, is we have, I think, to give some consideration to history and law, and also uh, within the issue of, of land, um, a better way of going forward in reconciliation. And I'm going to be looking at uh, some current stuff that is based on very old stuff. Okay. Order and Council of the 23rd of June, 1870, transferred a vast area from the regime of the Hudson's Bay Company to Dominion of Canada. And I'm not going into how this occurred, but it includes this area. And it hasn't really received the attention of legalists or uh, historians, really. So I want to, uh, it's a matter that's been litigated. I would often say I, this is a work in progress. This is a work in regression. I'm going back 25 years, and that's happened uh, on two other occasions in the last year or so. I think it's time to retire. Um, <laughs> problem of law and history. Um, and I, as with Kent McNeil, I, am, uh, I got a call from Jason Madden one day. He was laughing his head off. And he said, did you know you're the witness that didn't testify? So what are you talking about? Well, there was this case, and they put an article you wrote in. Um, so I'm going to give the sweep of the Crown's argument and make an empirical challenge to some of the key insertions. So very quickly, there is some written language in here that I think could be um, read in a more modern context that could be quite useful. Uh, address of 1867 from the Canadian Parliament pledges equal, equal principles have been uniformly governed the British Crown as deemed as the Aborigines. More importantly, in my view, this is a language that was negotiated with Canada and the Hudson's Bay Company. Claims the Indians' compensation required for the possession of so much should be disposed in the Canadian government communication program, and the company shall be relieved of all responsibility. Very, very similar language. Uh, in uh, the deed of surrender, okay, a, a recognition of compensation, the need to negotiate. Uh, and this is partly reiterated with the final address from the Canadian Parliament uh, 
1869 make adequate protect, uh, provisions for the protection, which I think is kind of a, a, a decline. Now, in this case up in the Yukon, and the point, key thing here is that this situation could have sweeping implication for across a vast part of the country, and especially, I think, could be problematic for the Métis. Um, so the questions they decided to define were the terms and conditions referred to the movement land or Northwestern Territory, blah, 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 intended to have legal force and effect and give rise to the obligations capable of being enforced by the court. Um, wrong question. Uh, we know the answer without doing any research or examination. Right? Uh, and then the other one relates to fiduciary, but no on that one, it'll be no on this one. Um, so the executive summary from the Crown's witness um, was basically saying that these are not judiciable, they're not enforceable by a legal process, they did not intend to make these uh, judiciable. So it's speaking to the intention of that language back in 1867 and 1869. That's the cut of it. Uh, so my focus here today is, if so, what is there so little recognition of treating Aboriginal rights that the legal authorities are silent in the late 19th and early 20th century? Now, there has been something done on this before by Kent McNeil. And honestly, Kent, sometimes I think you and I are the only guys that have read this uh, because he made a very, very strong argument that this um, process uh, is constitutional. Right? Uh, and I've also done this, and this 20-year-old article was thrown into the court uh, by the lawyer without ever consulting me. See, well, didn't even bother consulting me about this case. So the problem of history and law is kind of neatly but very superficially uh, put in as historians study the past for different ends. Lawyers want to solve present day problems by looking at the past and historians are the other way around. It's, uh, one is pragmatic and one is scientific, he would say. There has been a decision in this uh, and this decision really rests on what I'm now calling the official legal mind of the 19th and the 20th centuries. Um, so they agreed with Canada and they agreed with the expert witness that the order cannot create an obligation to negotiate treaties and that Canada retains discretion to decide if, when, and how to negotiate as a matter of crown pejorative. Well, I would say there's a large scope there for trying to reconcile, reconciling that position for what we need to do today. Um, so very high-powered witness, Cambridge, uh, submitted an expert report. But before that, to understand the report, you have to go to this academic prep, uh, uh, law history and memory engaged in the jurisprudence of Aboriginal right. Um, he, what he basically argues here is that, and this is largely true, that we've taken Calder and read it into the past when it didn't really exist in the past. So that's one of his arguments here, uh, which I think has validity, that we're reading Calder in as if these things all existed in the past and that there was this legal um, frame of mind that just was sort of ignored. Um, so presupposes a body of rules developed after Calder, but he says there is no record of those actors perceiving and shaping their conduct. And then he goes a bit further and he sees sort of what's being written today uh, in simple binary terms of dispossessor and dupe, bad guy and good guy, the crown and official as a sneering pantomime of villain of Victoria melodrama. So we know where he's ending up on this. Um, so two key things here, the old underpinning principle of unfettered non-judiciable executive discretion was gone with Calder, okay, can't sue the crown. Um, non-judiciable prerogative. And that what existed was by executive grace and legal imperative, okay. That's the framework he painted for the court and the court bought it. So deny intending legal rights could not meant rights. Dragging the present into the past with 20th century eyes. Uh, they only meant protection. Reference to claims that are indirect. Uh, Kent McNeil has referred to this as clairvoyancy. And I say that he had the capacity to read the minds and the minds of the long deceased. And he's constructed an official legal mind that had great sway. So what I'm gonna do in the time left is deal with on this point of some of the empirical problems. So what are some of the recognitions that occurred? Was the official legal mind incapable of recognizing rights and title and would act accordingly? Section 43 of the Dominion Land Act, 
basically says that the act does not apply to unceded lands. That is, they have no authority over non-treaty lands. Uh, Ontario, the superintendent uh, Reed said that with respect to treaties, the province can't control them, and that the Dobberman contends that treaties have all the force of and is as binding as any law on the statute book. Section 12 of some provincial uh, game reg legislation said that it, that it cannot be construed to affect any rights of the Indians by any treaty or regulations made by the Dominion. With respect to unceded lands, it also said that its provisions did not apply to those lands. So they're clearly drawing uh, the sort of uh, restrictions on themselves that would be based on a notion of title. Uh, and in a dep deputy minister of justice, in a legal opinion in 1910, said, with respect to an encroachment on the Robinson Treaties, I think it may well be argued that Indian rights exist independently of these treaties. Okay, it doesn't provide a rationale, but he says that. Ontario and Quebec boundary extension legislation, again, the province of Quebec will recognize uh, the rights of the Indian inhabitants above described. Ontario, very similar language, the province of Ontario recognized the Indian inhabitants in the territory, to the same extent obtained surrenders. Now here's some context, House of Commons on these things. The provincial tenure of public lands in which Indian title still exists is held to be subject to that title, which clouds the provincial title until it's removed by treaty or arrangements with the Indians. Justice Department opinion in 1922 trying to explain why they came up with the script system, cite section 14 of the imperial order, but more significantly it says, this enables the Canadian government in communication with the imperial government to extinguish the Indian title, and this is done by issuing land script to them, the Métis, as mentioned. The province can have no legal claim. <clears throat> what you get from this opinion, Indian title existed, recognition was given to an obligation by Canada to deal with Indian title, and which was stipulated in the Imperial Order of Council. Landscript was therefore an obligation arising out of the Imperial Order of Council of 1870. It's a constitutional element. Uh, and the interesting thing is they don't justify script on the Manitoba Act or the Dominion Land Act. They go to this constitutional instrument. So the idea here that the Indian Acts are the nearest thing that comes to anything happening, but there's nothing legal recognizing on non ceded or non ceded There's many of counterexamples on the empirical level, which I think if you're going to litigate these things in court, you have to have a handle on the historical documents. <laughs> so, uh, it, it is a matter of uh, a fact that I am a tendacious person, it was actually admitted in court that I used tendacious wording, but then judge for yourself on McHugh's wording here. Um, victimology of First Nations, a disservice to the past, you get it, okay? Was the Ross River cogently argued? The expert was never testified or even consulted. The lawyer used a 20-year-old article, an article not aimed at those problems. Neil, McNeil made a cogent argument around the constitutional angle back then. I think they asked the wrong questions. It's important historically, easily mucked up in court. The Crown emphasized the address of 1867. I emphasized term 14. Sort of litigations and the claims made really negate the spirit of reconciliation. The sort of arguments that are being made in court are just astonishing. The, the, the Crown basically said it didn't know why it had treated after after um, 1871, why it had these trees, but it certainly hadn't to do anything to do with the Robert's Land Order. The problem of history and law remains, and what we really are missing here is the political economy. In this same order, the Hudson Bay Company received a massive land grant that led to millions of dollars of revenue. I think this side of it has to be part of having a context not just the law of the documents, but a context of what's going on, and I think that's part of reconciliation. <laughs>
Uh, and thanks uh, to the panel for their, their very uh, concise and, and sophisticated arguments. We actually have a full 15 minutes uh, for Q&A. Um, so I would invite anyone who has a, a question uh, to step up to one of the mics uh, at this time. I'll get it started because I'm sure other people have questions. So I'm going to pull the first one that came to me, which was during Karen's um, uh, piece. Uh, yeah, just what do you make of the SEC in um, Métis, uh, the MMF case, and uh, how it actually critiques its own sort of approach to uh, the Métis three identity factors and suggest that it's going to take a different approach for 9124 and even suggest that the community acceptance test is too stringent for 9124. But how does it, I don't know, it, it confuses me and my students when we talk about it in class. So what did you think? Yeah, well, I did want to talk a little bit about that uh, just because I want to be able to say my very favorite quotation from Chris Anderson, which is um, he wrote an op-ed piece in the Globe Mail after Daniels where he called it the coming of the zombie apocalypse. And every opportunity I get to quote that, I like to try to. Um, I guess what I would say, though, is uh, yes, so it's the coming of the zombie apocalypse because we thought that the whole notion of Métis as mixed was dead, but then we see it rise from the grave in Daniels. But the zombies are just that, they're zombies. They're kind of weak and can't really uh, do much because Section 9124 is not about rights, it's just about jurisdiction, right? So it doesn't change anything about who is a rights bearer with respect to the Métis, and it doesn't change anything about the Pauli test. Um, I mean, it essentially just says that almost the court's going to use the terms Métis and non-status interchangeably with respect to jurisdiction, right? Not with respect to rights. Uh, a comment and a question. Uh, Alan, well, thank you all for your great presentations. Alan, went, uh, thank you for using uh, narrative as a way to teach us, and I just wanted to comment that listening to your story, um, it, it invoked in me anger, and I wanted um, to revolt. So that revolution comment was, was where I got to at the end of that story. But my question is for Dr. Tuff. Um, I'm wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on where you left off. If you could talk just for a minute about the political economy implications of the transfer to the HPC. Thank you. Now you can. Okay, so I didn't lay down the foundations here, but in, six, in 1670, Hudson's Bay Company got a charter grant from the king that grant, made this massive grant in terms of monopoly trade lights and proprietary interests in land. What happens then is the company uses that charter and surrenders the rights in those charter in exchange for certain compensation, and that gets dragged out. And the thing that puts it in the ball rolling is the creation of the International Financial Society in London in 1863, which were major British bankers, uh, buying into the Hudson's Bay Company, you know, a little rinky-dink operation on the periphery of the world, and reorient attempting to reorientate the company. So eventually they negotiate a surrender of their charter rights, which may be dubious, but they got into the process anyway. So they got 300,000 pounds cash, from the Canadian government that had to be borrowed, paid off in 1905. It was an issue in treaty negotiations in Treaty 4. The gambler says, we want those 300,000 pounds, it's not your land. Right? They got a land around the post, which one can understand, but 50,000 acres around the post. And it got one-tenth of the Fertile Belt settled township lands, which run from the south of the North Saskatchewan River to the international border, uh, west from the uh, Rocky Mountains out into uh, uh, the Winnipeg River. It got one tenth of the sur uh, one twentieth of the surveyed lands there, which was about seven million acres, which it very prudently sold off and amassed a huge amount of capital. It is the only one of these state chartered mercantile companies that survived. Every other one, the East India Company, the Royal Africa Companies, all these mercantile creations disappeared. It's the only company of its kind that's still in existence today, and it did that by trading in on a rather dubious land claim, 
and turning that into capital. And at the same time, we're arguing here now what is to me a, a horrendously unjust sort of line of reasoning. Uh, and when you look at the indigenous people, if you were to com convert, you know, what did they get? Well, in Manitoba, I think the, um, the Hudson's Bay Company ended up getting about 7% of the surveyed lands by 1930. Indigenous people had less than 2%. There's more road allowances in Manitoba than surveyed reserve lands in 1928. So this is all about this horrendous inequality that creates poverty, uh, which is sanctioned legally, in which uh, I think a lot of lawyers have blinkers on that side of it. And I think it is a really relevant dimension to litigation because the question here is, what is the outcome of the transfer of Rupert's land? I have a question for, for anybody on the panel, but t keeping in mind what uh, Professor Tuff is saying about new historical evidence coming forward and being, uh, needing to be aware of, of the latest that's there. I'm just wondering about the relationship between res judicata on the one hand, the, the holding that you know, a decision is binding and the fact that new evidence opens up. I just think uh, a, a good example in constitutional law, not Aboriginal law, this year is the, uh, the Como case where a provincial court judge departed quite in, in, ex, in extreme fashion from a Supreme Court of Canada decision in the 1920s, Gold Seal, dealing with interpretation of Section 121 of the Constitution Act. That, that's an example of, of how things can open up. I'm just wondering if you have any comments on, on um, in what cases you might, you might want to argue that, that the Supreme Court should reconsider a case, given new historical evidence. I, I would say the NRTA. I would say go back to the Horseman decision, which was really uh, total, total fiction. Uh, they, they imagine that there's a quid pro quo where there's a trade-off of commercial rights for expanded rights. They did not look at the documents. Uh, so that is one case where all the documentation has to be put there. And there's also a need, E.P. Thompson talks about it, is that it, these documents have to be uh, interrogated with a kind of historical logic of disbelief and skepticism. And what I found out that when I understand now maybe more why lawyers want to apply this sort of deductive uh, black letter type stuff and it, you know, the, docu the explanation is plain on its face. When they've drifted into history, which I don't think we can avoid with these hard cases in Aboriginal law, it almost becomes chaos. Uh, there's no order really to how this documentation is really looked at. And I'll give you an example. The court did was aware of section 43 of the Dominion Lands Act, which clearly says this legislation has no authority over unceded lands, which to me has certain legal implications. What they simply did is said, well, we don't have the historical context for that. So on one hand, rather, rather than sort of taking, uh, you know, the rules of interpretation, uh, ordinary meaning to the languages there, they suddenly decide that they need context. And often the context is not there. Like that Justice Department opinion, which I think was mind-blowing, there's not a lot of context for it. Right? So it, it, I find it very sloppy. I find a lot of sloppy logic as well uh, in the legal arguments and what, what comes down. So the case that I would say that really needs to be re-examined uh, because it's been so ad hoc, every, every uh, adjudication of the NRTA paragraph 12 um, has been a, a new rendition. The definition of Indian has been changing throughout that and the courts have not had that before them. So it really goes problematic with horsemen, where they invent this quid pro quo that there's absolutely no historical evidence of that. And there's absolutely no historical evidence that they're out to modify, as Badger says, to modify and change the treaty. There's no evidence of that. And there's quite a bit of evidence on these negotiations because they're quite fundamental. There's all kinds of sources on them. And they're carried out between 1926 and 1930. There's royal commissions after that. Um, and uh, so I would say that would be a case where new evidence would, could be brought forward. Hi, I just want to thank all of you for a, a really stimulating panel. My, my question is for Professor Otis. You, you, I thought, contrasted those two approaches to indigenous law and the modern treaties very well and interestingly. I understood the, the kind of separation thesis and then the maybe a, an incorporation on the part of the, 
the Labrador Inuit. And I just wonder, do we know anything about how those models have played out? That is the consequence of selecting model A and B in terms of either the, the satisfaction of the parties at having selected one or the other models or what we see in terms of uh, the, the on the ground experience of, of either of those choices. Thanks. That's a um, very, very good question. I haven't, come to, I haven't done any follow-up work on the ground with the, with the communities. And you know what? There's a big partnership, a research partnership coming up now uh, that deals exclusively uh, with modern treaties. And one of their uh, themes is precisely the relationship between indigenous laws and modern treaties. And that would be a good idea to put forward a proposal, a research proposal on that very specific question. I know for sure uh, from you know my t discussions with some Nishika chiefs that they've had uh, actual issues. A very easily underst understood example is the fact that the Nishika Treaty grants or recognizes hunting rights to Nishka individuals uh, over the whole area of the Nishka of Nishka land uh, as defined by the treaty. And therefore, the treaty overlooks customary uh, boundaries between clan uh, hunting grounds. So what if uh, an individual decides that, I mean, he's going or she's going to hunt on on you know, another clan's land. And that's allowed, that's permitted by the treaty, but that's prohibited by customary law. You know? And that example was given to me as one of the clashes between in, in Nishgo law, non-state Nishgo law, and official Nishgo law I mean, pursuant to the treaty. And the way they deal with these cases is e either in a preventive manner by going to the individual's concern and talking, explaining to them you know, the legitimacy of traditional rules, the, their need to uphold the traditional rules. And if they fail, then there are customary sanctions. And as the chief said to me, well, if he goes on the neighboring clan's land without asking per for permission, pursuant to customary law, he will never do it again. <laughs> Meaning we have the ability through our customary uh, institutions to make sure that this won't happen in the future. So there are, it is not only a theoretical uh, issue. Um, the Inuit have not uh, codified their law at all uh, up to now, that's for sure, that's a fact. But how has this played out on the ground since the conclusion of the treaty? I do not know, empirically speaking, and that I would be very interesting in seeing the results of an empirical research on that. So, uh, is this on? Yeah. Uh, so Frank brought my name up a couple of times, so I thought I should say something. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically, I agree with what Frank is saying, that, you know, in this Ross River case, for example, the evidence was very one-sided, and I don't know why Frank, for example, wasn't called as a witness to rebut Paul McHugh's evidence. Uh, but I'd also like to say that I, I think that, that McHugh's evidence was very one-sided, and when he talks about, and this is a big important issue, he talks about indigenous rights, in particular Aboriginal title, not being justiciable, not being legal rights, until the modern era starting in Canada with Calder. And I think this is just wrong, and that these rights did exist in the 19th century, uh, but indigenous peoples had no real opportunity to go to court, the Indian Act in 1927 prevented them from hiring lawyers to go to court. And even in cases like the, the St. Catherine's case, where Aboriginal title and the definition of uh, was at issue, they weren't parties, they weren't called as witnesses, and there was no evidence on their use of the land, their relationship with the land, or on their own indigenous law. So, a case like St. Catherine's was decided on the basis of lack of evidence, not on the basis of lack of law. And I think this is really important. There are cases from not long after St. Catherine's, it was 1888, 
uh, in the early 19th century, 20th century rather, from Africa and from New Zealand that showed if indigenous law was proven in court that the Privy Council in London would rely on that law to find that the indigenous people had land rights. That law was available at the time. So I just wanted to make that point. Uh, another point I want to make here is this whole issue about evidence and the importance of it in these kind of cases and the role of expert witnesses. So I actually wrote an article about this. It was in the Saskatchewan Law Review a couple of years ago, two or three years ago. But directly in relation to this case, the Ross River case, and the role of um, Paul McHugh as an expert witness. And he uh, purports to be a legal historian. He's re really more a lawyer like myself. So I don't really purport to be a legal historian. And the problem is that witnesses can testify in court as to facts and experts can testify and give opinions in relation to factual matters, but they can't testify on the law that the judge has to apply in the case. And I'm really speaking to the lawyers in the room here that you have to be very careful not to allow the Crown witnesses, for example, to testify on the law. And that happened in this case. I mean, that's what McHugh is testifying on. He's saying, well, there, were no, there was no law you know, protecting these rights. They're all unenforceable up until Calder and so on. Um, so I think that's the second point. What is the role of expert witnesses? And lawyers have to challenge them when they go beyond that. Uh, you know, I mentioned that one case in which I was an expert witness. I testified on international law, which is, is acceptable because that's not the domestic law of the uh, Canadian courts. Uh, but interestingly, and this is just anecdotal, the lawyer for the Crown, when he cross-examined me, asked me all kinds of questions about Canadian law and Section 35, and even the judge entered into those questions. I thought, well, this is interesting. <laughs> but, uh, and the lawyer for the First Nation didn't object because they wanted this evidence in. But it wasn't evidence, right? It shouldn't have come from, from an expert. So this is a really important point about the role of experts, too. Sorry to talk so long, but I thought these were important points. Um, hello, I, I'm Tanya Harnett, and um, I'm Nakota and from the Carry the Kettle Band. And um, I would fall under the Treaty 4 um, uh, agreements. Um, looking at what Frank was talking about, and he kind of went over really fast, uh, was talking about uh, gambler statements. The gambler statement uh, in the Alexander Morris's um, accounts of the treaty, signing of the treaties. And it is gambler who says, uh, what's, what I have a problem with is the HBC. How does HBC um, get involved with this? So he's questioning, and it's a really important point that he is questioning, how does HBC get involved? And that's, I'd like to see if you can comment on that a little bit more. I'll do a quick, I'll, I'll do a quick switch. Um, it, it gets, uh, Morris ducks the question, and I think he misleads him on it. But the other case where this comes up is Lou Riel in the Provisional Council when they're debating the list of rights. And one of the things that Riel was insisting upon was a um, abrogation of that agreement. He felt that the negotiations should simply be from the people of the Northwest, the people of Red River with the Canadian government, that the company had no interest. It was he referred to them as absentee landowners. They had no interest in it. They shouldn't, and that this whole agreement should be set aside. And he was unable actually to get a majority in, his, in, in the um, Legislative Assembly of Assiniboia on that question remained on the rights, and it's actually a bit of a, a non-stopper in pragmatic sort of ways uh, because it doesn't get into the Manitoba Act. In fact, the opposite gets into the Manitoba Act, which is the deal with the Hudson's Bay Company uh, is recognized. So it actually gets constitutionalized in another view. Same thing in the Quebec and Ontario boundary extensions. The Hudson's Bay Company interest in the lands is also referentially incorporated. So 
you know, obviously they didn't have a lot of information on this, but clearly there was uh, divergence of views uh, about, you know, whose territory it was uh, and who should benefit from that. Clearly that was there, and I would say uh, almost 150 years later we have not got that convergence. Okay, so um, that's all the time we have for this panel.